God lives and works today. Is there anyone who doesn't have a sorrow in his life, who has never known suffering? Ever since Adam and Eve were driven out of the garden, mankind has had to live with sorrow and suffering. That is why there is no question as vital as, how can I overcome my suffering? How can I make it lose its crippling power in my life? Today's meditation by Basilea Schlink will tell us about a power that is greater than every suffering. That there have been people who have overcome suffering is clear. The chronicles of the early church tell us about countless martyrs who triumphed in a royal way over the most difficult sorrow and suffering. Take, for example, the elderly bishop Polycarp of Smyrna. As he stood bound to the funeral pyre, surrounded by angry, raging crowds, he prayed aloud, Lord God, I thank you that you have counted me worthy of this day and this hour, that I have been allowed to become one of the number of martyrs to share in the sufferings of your Son, Jesus Christ. This isn't just a happening of long ago. It's something that the martyrs of Jesus have experienced throughout the centuries, to this very day. And we too should be able to experience this within the frame of our own small lives, with our sorrows that are often very small. There truly is a power that is greater than every suffering. Love for Jesus. It was love for Jesus that made those first Christian martyrs able to thank God for their suffering. And when we, in our lives, must confess time and again that our suffering has oppressed and enslaved us, we are actually accusing ourselves. It is a sign that the love for Jesus is still very weak in our lives. It is not the vital power that proves to be greater and stronger than every suffering. How can we acquire this love for Jesus in our lives? We must look at our suffering in the same way that Jesus did when he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. If we humbly say, Yes, Father, yes, with all my heart, lay your suffering upon me, I will bear it gladly. Then the doors of heaven will open. A stream of grace will flow down upon us and transform our suffering into bliss, just as the first Christians experienced. When we surrender our will completely to the Father, saying yes to the suffering, then Jesus' love will stream into our hearts, and with it we shall be filled with a great love for Jesus. It is a matter of surrendering the will, for love is unity, two wills made one in love. Therefore, listen to this good news. Love for Jesus is greater than every suffering. You can receive it as a precious gift. How? When you humbly say, Yes, Father, to the sorrow and suffering in your life. I can testify from my own life. Through a yes to the will of God, the power of suffering has been completely broken. You have been listening to a program written by Basileia Schlink of the Little Land of Canaan. To learn more about how God lives and works today, visit us at our website, www.canaan.org. That's K-A-N-A-A-N dot org. If you contact us, we would be happy to send you a free inspirational booklet. If you do not have access to the web, please contact this radio station for our postal address. God bless you. God lives and works today. Yes, in this time of trouble and temptation, when the world seems to grow less safe every day, God is a mighty refuge and a stronghold. That is why it is so important that we make Him our home and let Him make His home with us. However, 
Everyone knows that the main ingredient for a real home is love. Today's meditation by Basilea Schlink tells us what kind of love this is and why it is so important for us to attain it. Jesus says in John 14, verse 23, If a man loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. We're living in a time when the question of whether or not we love Jesus has become more essential than ever before, for we're on the threshold of the most difficult times that this world has ever seen. There's only one thing which can help us to cope with our world situation today and with the anxiety and fear which it brings. That is our relationship to our Lord Jesus. Is He the controlling force in our lives? Is He the first love of our hearts? As we read earlier, in John chapter 14, He wants to dwell in us and manifest His power in us. But He can only do this if we, as our verse said, keep His word and love Him. But how can we be sure that we really love Him? The Lord gave me light about this matter through an experience that I had. Previously, I thought that since I believed in Jesus, I loved him as well. But this experience showed me differently. A person to whom I was greatly attached disappointed me deeply. Our friendship seemed to be ruined. I was completely miserable. But then I realized something's wrong. If this sorrow can so overcome me and nothing can comfort me, then this person and not Jesus is my first love. Yes, if one thing or another absorbs us so completely that we lose control of ourselves, for example, we can't sleep or we're filled with worry about this or that, then our love for Jesus is out of order. That which occupies and rules our hearts is our God, our idol. And if it's a person or a wish, a difficulty or a certain care that fills our hearts, then that has become our God for the time being. Jesus so yearns for our love. He so yearns to have a deep personal relationship with us that will carry us through the coming times of horror and terror. Therefore, let us remove all that is in our hearts that hinders us from giving him our first love. Let us surrender ourselves completely to Him, giving Him our idols, renouncing all that absorbs us, committing ourselves anew to following Him along the ways which He chooses for us. Let me, Lord, go along with you, both joy and sorrow share with you, close at your side forever. This program by Basilea Schlink has come to you from the little land of Canaan. If you would like a free leaflet by the same author, please write to God Lives and Works Today, 9849 North 40th Street, Phoenix, Arizona, 85028-4099. That's God Lives and Works Today, 9849 North 40th Street, Phoenix, Arizona, 85028-4099. God bless you. God lives and works today. He is calling us to prepare a way for Him, so that through each one of us He may come to the whole world. That is why the message of John the Baptist is a special message for us in today's program by Basilea Schlink. When John the Baptist was born, the neighbors must have asked, What will this baby grow up to be? And what did he become? God chose him and made him ready to live not for himself, but for Jesus, the coming Messiah. The dearest wish of John the Baptist was to decrease in relation to his Lord 
who had come down from heaven to earth. And so he rejoiced as the number of his own disciples decreased and those of Jesus increased. Who can know how much John the Baptist must have loved Jesus? It was this devoted love which made John the Baptist the true forerunner of the Messiah. But how did he attain this self-forgetting love? What made him such a powerful preacher of repentance, whose words the people could not ignore? Surely this, John the Baptist was the first who turned to repentance and let his pride be broken. He spent many years in the wilderness until he came to preach repentance before the multitudes. There he practiced repentance daily. This was the root of his power as preacher and as one who prepared a way in the wilderness. John the Baptist had lived out the repentance to which he called others. Brought low under God's judgment, he was prepared to be the herald of the coming Lord. John the Baptist still speaks to us today when the second coming of Christ draws near. Jesus waits once more for those who will be ready to prepare the way. He seeks modern-day followers of John the Baptist, who will devote themselves to following our Lord Jesus. He waits for those who will live daily in the spirit of repentance. Jesus is standing at the door as the one who's coming, but he can't come if the way is not prepared. Shall we not hearken to this call of Jesus and walk in the footsteps of John the Baptist? Shall we not become our Lord's forerunners? Oh, may our hearts so radiate love for our Lord Jesus that others will be enkindled as well. program by Basileia Schlink has come to you from the little land of Canaan. If you would like a free leaflet by the same author, please write to God Lives and Works Today, 9849 North 40th Street, Phoenix, Arizona, 85028-4099. That's God Lives and Works Today, 9849 North 40th Street, Phoenix, Arizona, 85028-4099. God bless you. God lives and works today. Yes, today He is working and calling us to plan ahead, to take advantage of a wonderful opportunity, but only for a limited time. Why just for a limited time? The answer is in today's program by Basilea Schlink, Planning Ahead. Most people today plan ahead for their time of retirement, but how many plan ahead for eternity? One of the young sisters of our sisterhood was called Angelica. Although she had contracted a fatal disease through her work in her earlier life, she still became a member of our sisterhood. Soon the symptoms of her illness told her that the last years of her life had arrived. She, a young girl bubbling over with life, was looking death in the eye and also the judgment of God. Everything that had been important to her on earth suddenly lost its luster. It would be taken away from her at the moment of death. But that which would remain stood before her eyes, that is, 
her sins. She knew that her sins must be forgiven while she was still alive. God, whose word is irrevocable, has said, We will be judged according to our works. What did Sister Angelica do? She went to everyone with whom she had come into contact during her short life, and to whom she had said an angry or bitter word, or had done something unkind or unjust, and asked them for forgiveness. Yes, she confessed her sins before God and man, and asked for forgiveness. Our sister Angelica was radiant with happiness because the Lamb of God, to whom she had brought her sins, had forgiven her. Her sin was washed away because Jesus had taken it to his cross. His blood covered her guilt. And as sick as she was, she rejoiced and sang, My sins are all forgiven. I am free. I am free. Yes, Jesus had taken her guilt away. She had been pardoned. The fact that we all must die calls us to take precautions, to plan ahead. Let us prepare ourselves by repenting and confessing our sins. For what is not confessed before God, and where necessary also before man, what is not brought into the light of Jesus cannot come under his atoning blood. Today, let us go to those whom we have wronged. Tomorrow might be too late. Jesus, the eternal love, is calling to us. Come to me to receive forgiveness of your sins. For if you confess your sins, I am faithful and just and will forgive your sins. Jesus, you are my Redeemer. I trust in your great might. Jesus, you are the victor. For me you won the fight. You have been listening to a program written by Basilea Schlink of the Little Land of Canaan. To learn more about how God lives and works today, visit us at our website, www.canaan.org. That's K-A-N-A-A-N dot org. If you contact us, we would be happy to send you a free inspirational booklet. If you do not have access to the web, please contact this radio station for our postal address. God bless you.